Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, this is our third public forum on the proposed Turkfield project that we will be running. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces around the room. Thank you so much for being here. Some new faces too. So for those of you who I don't know, um, I am Dee King. I'm the athletic director here um, and just excited to have people here um, it, to learn more about the project, to support it, to ask questions about it. That's certainly the purpose of our public forum. So um, thank you so much for spending your night with us. Um, so just to take a moment to do some introductions, um, we have Dr. Carol Kavanaugh here with us. Oh, hi, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, who is our acting superintendent of schools and will officially take on the job starting July 1st. So thanks for being here tonight and just wanted to introduce her um, as a, a new member of uh, this committee and just someone who is, I know, been supportive of us in this endeavor. Um, also, I'd like to take a moment to introduce and acknowledge Jean Birchman, um, the chair of our school committee who has been, I, I'm not even sure how to accurately describe the amount of work, hours, energy that Jean has spent on this project, mentoring me, working with me, and taking so much of her own time on top of many, many other responsibilities. So I just wanted to take a minute um, to acknowledge her and thank her for, for all that she has done to get us to this point. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge um, the members of our subcommittee who have attended so many meetings over the last two years to plan for this, who have spent tons of hours out doing site visits, learning about infills, um, gathering information from the community, projecting um, all the information that we need to know as we prepare to bring this project forward to town meeting. So just a lot happening here and a lot of people who have done so much work behind the scenes. So just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them. Um, many are here tonight, a few are unable to attend due to um, conflicts. So um, first I wanted to take a minute to just introduce our principal, Evan Bishop. Um, Evan has been so supportive of this project over the last two years um, and is an advocate for all student activities and enhancing the student experience here at Hockington High School. So athletics is certainly one of those and, and we're lucky to have him behind that, but he is supporting all of the student activities that exist here um, and this just happens to be one that's on the forefront right now. Um, Susan Rothermick is our Director of Finance. Um, she's not able to be here tonight, but she's been an integral part of this process. Also, <coughs> Tim Person, who is at a marathon planning meeting tonight, so with that big event coming up. Um, but he's, he's been fantastic. I introduced Jean. John Graziano, another member of our school committee. Uh, Dan Terry is here through Parks and Rec. Dan, give a little wave. There's Dan back there. Um, John Schwartz is one of our community members and has been doing some of our PR. He's back there Facebooking live. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, Amy Mick is one of our community members and also um, works in the Athletic Facilities Administration. Amy, where are you? Oh, Amy's back there. Um, we also have Jim Ballas, who is not here right now, but um, has been working on some of our community fundraising efforts. Kelly DiPaolo, who is a member of the community at large, but who is just sort of had her hands in all aspects of the project and has um, really immersed herself in it. Um, and then Al Rogers, um, our former director of Buildings and Grounds, who's also a community member and just has a ton of knowledge um, about the town, town processes. He's on um, CPC and he's just had a um, really helpful voice in this process. So a lot of people there who are officially on the committee and then we also have um, our liaisons from the Board of Selectmen, Brian Herr. Um, give a little wave, Brian. So, um, Brian Herr has um, been in attendance at all our meetings and has been a huge advocate for this project and also Pam Wax, that's from Appropriations, who's not able to be here tonight. Um, but again, wanted to take a moment to um, publicly acknowledge these people who are just donating their time to try and create a positive situation for our school and community that, that we feel that both deserve. So um, really appreciate all of those efforts and I know that we're not done yet and that there's still more to be done but to acknowledge how much has happened thus far and, and just how much everyone appreciates it. Um, we also have 
from Gale Associates, Kathy Herbel. They are uh, the engineering firm that we've been working with. Kathy's over here, um, and so she has been working us through, working with us through the feasibility study, but then um, also worked with us on the design of the proposed project. So lots of time spent together. Um, really trying to get to where we're at right now and Kathy also has a vested interest as a community member um, and so she's been she's been great to work with um, and has been really accessible to us and helpful to us um, and we also have with us tonight um, from US Green Tech Stephen Torbeck Stephen flew up from Ohio um, to share with us um, some information you'll hear from him in a little bit on the infill um, which the committee has selected. So it's called Envirofill, and I'm not even going to pretend to speak as intelligently about it as Stephen can. Um, but I think that that's going to be one of the most interesting parts of tonight's presentation, as he's really going to be able to speak a little bit about the infill, as that's been a question that a lot of people have asked about and um, have had just, just some general inquiries, some concerns, um, just want to be addressed. So that would be great to have Stephen talk a little bit about that. Um, and then Andrew, where's Andrew? Andrew oh, Andrew. Andrew, can you remind me of your last yeah, name? Yeah, it's hard to pronounce Dijak. Okay, Andrew Dijak is here, um, and he is um, working with us and has doing the carpet. Um, so there's a lot of different sort of aspects of this project, and you can imagine a lot of different people coming and working together. So Andrew's come up from Connecticut to be part of our presentation tonight and learn a little bit more about the project. Um, from a public standpoint. So just wanted to thank everyone for being here and introduce those key players as we sort of dive into our evening here. So our agenda for this evening, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about why Turf Now, why, why we're pushing this project forward and why we think that it's so important for our community. Um, just quickly talk a little bit about some of the field use um, demands that we have in, in the current state of our athletic programs in terms of what's available to us some of the existing conditions, uh, the actual proposed project, and then the project schedule. Uh, we'll also, that after that, I'll be turning it over to Stephen to talk a little bit about the infill to inform you about that. Um, also wanted to acknowledge the community coordination that has gone into this project and how um, it's been a collaborative effort between uh, the, town, the town and the schools, youth soccer, parks and rec, um, we've worked with all liaisons from the different youth programs in town um, and how this is something that, this is a project that we feel has such huge community value. It's not just something that um, we've been trying to push forward for the schools. And I think that, I hope that that's demonstrated by the number of people who are representative of the committee and who have been so invested in this process. Um, at that point, we'll have a little bit of time to do some breakout sessions for people who might have more specific um, questions on those community partnerships and what that will look like. Um, we'll have a breakout session on the financial impacts and then also one specifically on infill where um, Stephen will be available to talk a little bit more um, and has some samples to share if people are interested. Um, after that we'll just talk about the next steps and where we're at in the process <laughs> and certainly have an opportunity for anyone here to ask any questions that you might have. Okay, so in terms of why turf fields now, um, I think that, you know, as I look around the room, I know that there are many people who um, have asked this question, asked why we don't have it, and, and sort of how we're here right now. And I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to look back and figure out all the reasons, you know, why we don't have it. But I think if we ask the question, why are we trying to move forward with it, and why do we feel that it's such an essential piece to add to our school and community at this point, that would be what we'd want to focus on. Um, and as I mentioned before, just the need for field space that we have due to the number of participants we have in our athletic programs, which is you know, over 50% of our student body are participating in athletics, um, and the number of teams we have. We have 70 teams uh, between our high school and our middle school, and that is far exceeds any other school in the Tri-Valley League by almost 15 teams. Um, so it's awesome. We want that for our student athletes. We want them to participate and be part of it. But we also want them to have adequate practice and playing surfaces and space. Um, so that's, that's, I would say, one of the really important pieces that, that drove us to where we are right now. Um, you know, prioritizing safety for student athletes um, in terms of, you know, there are so many aspects of that. And, and we were able to go to the board select meeting last night and talk a little bit about the safety aspect of this project. But currently, uh, where we have been so 
um, generously given time at Fruit Street um, from their, they take away from what their um, potential rental income is from private usage to allow the high school to come over there at a, you know, a very low rate and use their fields. But as many of you know who have done it, when you drive from Hockington High School to Fruit Street at school dismissal time, it can be 25 minutes to get there. Student drivers there, oftentimes no athletic trainer because we have events happening here at the high school. So um, the need for turf fields here on the high school campus for our athletic programs in school has, there are so many reasons for that. And from a safety standpoint, you know, those are just two examples of, um, you know, having that accessibility on campus of not having students have to be transported almost a half hour each day just to practice and also having our athletic trainer present is huge. Um, the increased availability of facilities um, right now, you know, as you know, we're limited by weather and daylight. Um, weather at this point, um, our spring season started on March 20th. We are not on our fields. Um, in speaking with Tim Person, our director of buildings and grounds facilities, he said, I don't know that you'll be on any fields until May. Um, and that is just such a shame for our student athletes and programs. They've been practicing in a gym. Um, and so for those of you who are familiar with sports, you know, practicing baseball in a gym is not an accurate reflection of playing baseball on grass. And um, you know, you could say that for any of the sports. It's, you know, maybe a better comparison would be to say, you know, we're gonna go play ice hockey or practice ice hockey in a gym, but then you're gonna have your first game, but it's gonna be on ice. Um, and so it's just not, our kids aren't adequately prepared or ready for the playing surface. Um, our baseball team had their first game today in Medfield, and they have not practiced on a grass field yet, but they're playing a game today. So just seems unfair to our, to our student athletes. So that's something that we really wanted to highlight. Um, certainly, it would, having a turf field would allow for the extension of seasonal field usage due to the New England weather conditions. So it would extend our availability in terms of months. Um, we could stay on fields later, get on them earlier in the spring, but also in terms of daylight. Um, right now, we're limited you know, to early in the spring, 6 o'clock, 6.30, maybe 7, when you're trying to keep in mind safety of throwing a ball and catching it without lights. Um, so that would be such a huge advantage for us and help. Uh, and at this point, in terms of just comparison of, of some of our comparable communities, there are 12 schools in the Tri-Valley League at this point, and we're uh, one of three that do not have turf, and that is Millis and Norton. And it just, you know, I think it's important to take advantage of that and, and think about that, that fact, as Hopkinton is so cutting edge and progressive in so many areas, and athletics for not sure why, but has been compromised in terms of this one area. Um, and, you know, we have this amazing facility and amazing opportunity to create space within our school and community to support certainly the athletic programs, but also provide opportunity within our community for this to be a gem back here. And um, I think that it's time that we allow this area of our school to, to flourish and you know to have that opportunity to excel. Um, there's also the revenue generating opportunity that exists through community and private use. Um, and that a revolving fund would be set up for you know, the private rentals, the community rentals. And so I think it's important to mention that, I've said it a couple times, that this is not just something that we would view as an asset to our schools, but one to our community that our youth programs would use. Right now, um, you know, I know the Little League runs a big tournament in the summer and they struggle to find a, a good place to use it. And you know, it's, this is a situation that creates a space for, for some of these programs, but also brings people into Hopkinton. There's 400 people just for that one tournament that come in, they're eating, they're you know helping our businesses in town, there's just so much positive. The soccer tournaments that happen that right now utilize Fruit Street, but if you could maximize the use of Fruit Street and a turf field at the high school, there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are coming and they stay planted and they want to eat here and they go to the grocery store here and they're grabbing, you know, they're, it just helps our town on so many levels. So I think it's important to acknowledge some of those other facts that, um, or other benefits to this project in addition to just, you know, increasing field time and allowing our students time on turf. Um, and the other piece of it is just, you know, again, I've mentioned it a few times, but just that pride in our school 
uh, our athletic programs and in our community facilities. We obviously have a, a beautiful high school. We have state-of-the-art buildings and amazing schools being built in town right now. We just had this, a library and the new facilities building. There's just so many positive things happening and it's um, there's a lot of projects and I recognize that, but it's also a time where we're getting everything going and we're um, in this progressive state and this is something that I think would be an app, would add value to this town and to our community. Um, so just really quickly, um, I won't spend too much time on this, but just to get an idea of the teams that use the field and the demand, um, basically we assumed you know, three hours a day per team. In the fall we have 16 teams using the field. To give them adequate playing and practice time, we really need 240 hours, but we have available 144 hours. So we're renting out Fruit Street, teams are doing fundraising to go to private facilities, um, and you know we also want to, because of the grass field, we don't practice on game fields because we want to preserve them. So you know those fields are sort of eliminated from a practice standpoint, whereas you don't have to have that type of, um, you don't have to make those accommodations with turf. You can practice on it and play on it the next day and you're not ruining it. So um, having that increased availability is, is really important because the hours you know, are extended obviously for the day. You have some more weekend availability um, you know, in terms of seasonal extension and um, daylight extension. So just wanted to kind of note those limitations and the term, the fact that you know what we have here is exceeding uh, the availability. Um, probably didn't even need to have this slide because you have all probably either driven by or seen what what the spring field conditions look like. But um, if you were to walk out on the fields right now, um, unless you had waterproof boots on or something like that, your feet are going to get wet. You cannot safely play a game on the fields right now, um, just due to the spring weather that we've had. And it's cold, and then it rains, and then it's cold, and then it rains. We haven't had any warm, dry days to, um, to help the fields sort of get up to the place where they need to be. So not only is this a safety issue, but we also, from a maintenance standpoint, they haven't been able to line fields because they have to let it dry out for a day. As soon as they let it dry out, and they maybe go to line the next day, it rains. So um, that's also a sort of impacted our um, ability to get on fields and continues to push us back. Um, so now some of the nitty gritty about the proposed project, which is the exciting part of this. So um, from a logistics standpoint, for those of you who are not um, super familiar with the layout, um, what you're seeing sort of at the bottom here is the uh, field three, which is where our football games are played and our track meets are. Um, and so the proposed project is on fields four and five, so it's actually behind uh, that field. And as you can see, it's a multi-purpose field. It would have a baseball diamond, a softball field, and then um, a rectangular field in the middle where all different sports could be played. Um, field hockey, soccer, lacrosse, um, you'd also be, you know, you can see football lines on there, though there won't be goal posts. You can, you know, that's, uh, our football team utilized Fruit Street a lot this past fall to prepare for their games that were coming up on turf. So having that space to get out there for spring tryouts and really simulate game situation or to adequately prepare for games is huge. Um, so again, huge combination synthetic turf field, improved drainage system, which um, I alluded to a little bit before, but fields Four and five and six right now are just the drainage, just it, all the water goes there and it just kind of stays saturated. Um, this also, this um, proposed project would also have ADA access to existing parking lots and there would be some additional um, handicapped spaces, athletic light installation and modification. Um, and if there are any questions about that part of it, I know Kathy would be happy to address those. Um, but you know, lots of different facts that were looked into and there's new lighting systems where it's pointing down and not shining in through woods into people's homes and I think that was a concern of, of the past that um, Muscle Lighting has addressed and does a really nice job with. There would be portable bleachers for viewing um, in a storage building. So at this point, you know, the big question is how much is it gonna cost? Um, and the cost at this point is $3.5 million before we talk about any of the grant funding or fundraising that's come into play, um, which when you think about it, you're actually getting three fields here. Um, so though it's one space, it's a really large space. 
Um, and so it, it's, it's actually the cost came in at lower than anticipated, which isn't always the case. So that was really exciting for the committee. Um, in terms of the schedule and where we're at right now, permitting, permitting is complete. The public bid is complete. So um, as I mentioned, US Green Tech, um, which is Envirofill, which is where um, Steven's company, um, they'll be doing the infill. Um, it's an it's a infill, it's not crumb rubber. Again, he'll speak a little bit more about it, but I think it's really important to note that as there's a very clear distinction between different types of infill. Um, Field Turf, um, where An Andrew's company is the turf carbon and shock pad. Um, and Green Acres Landscaping and Contru Construction Company would be um, doing all the contracting and the construction. Um, so all of that has happened. It's been out for public bid. They've been awarded. Um, and so at this point, where we're at in the process is, uh, as a committee, is to continue informing the community about all the efforts that have gone into this project, what we're proposing, um, and to encourage people to learn about it, ask questions about it, and if they have a vested interest in one way or another, to go to a town meeting on May 7th um, and exercise your democratic right. So, um, and hopefully that um, we would be awarded at that point in construction, so looking to break ground in June of 2018, so just in a few months, which has the potential to be really, really exciting for all of us, but um, you know, need to make sure that if, if this is a project that people are really hoping for, um, that they're, they're behind it and that they show that at town meeting. Um, really quickly wanted to touch upon the financial aspect of it as it's important to know a little bit about where we're at. Um, so you can see that the total cost, um, the actual is $3.5 million. Um, the CPC has generously um, approved a grant of $1.7 million, which is, I believe, the largest in their history. Um, an unbelievable amount of money it is, you know, just really exciting to receive that. And, and we learned about that um, in late winter uh, or late last year around the November, December timeframe. So to learn about that and know that that almost cut the cost of the project in half was huge. Um, we have a community fundraising goal of $500,000 that's ongoing. Um, we have members of our committee that are working on fundraising from corporate sponsors. Um, we also have a GoFundMe page going right now for any community members that are looking to demonstrate their support. So ultimately, we're looking at hopefully an ask of $1.3 million is the goal. Um, and when you look at the tax impact, if we weren't to have a, the CPC grant or any community fundraising, you're looking at $60 a year about um, on an average household over 10 years, $33 a year if we just applied the CPC grant. Um, and if we are able to reach our fundraising goal, $23 a year on an average household over 10 years. Um, so just important to note that is obviously the financial questions come up and are important to address. Um, so at this point, this is where we get into just a little bit about the specifics. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Herbel for a moment just to talk about the turf system and then Kathy will turn it over to Steven yep. to talk about Envirofill. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So this is just forward there. Oh, okay. okay. It's just the forward middle button. Yep. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick turf 101 just so people kind of understand. Um, you know, what goes into a turf field. Um, just starting out, so everybody understands, you hear the term carpet. Um, is there a pointer, D? I think on the top. Is it? Um, no. Okay. Um, just the, the top piece of the, what we refer to as the carpet, what you see is those, that's your, kind of your green grass, the plastic. Uh, polyurethane, um, grass fibers, that's called, that is the fibers. Um, the neck, and what's below that is what we call the turf backing. Again, that's also a, a plastic um, that those two combined is considered the carpet. So people hear these various terms through um, the discussions, you'll read things, whatever, that you can understand a little bit better. Um, the infill is, as you look, I don't want to cross the picture, but the infill is what actually goes in those fibers, this, this um, layer within here, which we are proposing the Envirofill, which we'll let Steve, Stephen talk about in a few minutes. But um, that's your, your infill piece, which can be sand, crumb rubber, whatever is selected um, through the committee and such. 
Um, below that, we're proposing a shock pad. Um, what the shock pad does is help with um, impact um, injuries, concussions, which has been a, a you know a big issue as you with the NFL, the whole um, you know series going on with that. So the, the school is committed to you know giving us the safest field um, available and to provide that that shock pad as a, that additional layer um, for safety, um, minimize um, concussions, impact type injuries. Um, below that then is our drainage systems. Why do these fields? You know, why, why can you play on them when it is raining? It's because of the stone base that gets put in below it. Um, it's usually somewhere 10 to 12 inches worth of a, a stone that has about 30% voids. What the voids mean, it allows the water somewhere to go. Um, so as it rains, it, the water literally goes through the field, where on a grass field, the water has to flow across the field. Um, and unfortunately, on the fields that happened in as now, they've been overused or compacted. That water can't even get through um, into the soil and um, you end up with your puddles and, and the wet situation. So what we design is that sub-base that takes the, the, the water, draws it away from the field, which allows you to use it um, during um, wet conditions. And then below the stone base, we have a kind of what we call a flat drain type system that as the water does eventually trickle through the stone, is collected by those pipes and then, and then taken out. Um, into where the water eventually ends up by the sheet flow and such up to the um, the outfall. So, um, but with that, I just, um, like I said, just to give you a sense of what goes in there, we basically come in, um, remove all the topsoil, and then um, come back in and put in this section of material. And just like, as Dee said, we've had some comments regarding infill and the selection of infill, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve with um, US Green Tech um, just to um, just speak about that. Thank you. So I feel like I'm back in high school again. Nobody wants to sit in the front row. <laughs> Typical. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times, I'm Steven with US Green Tech. Uh, US Green Tech specializes in infill and infill only. So um, this is our bread and butter. What I'm going to do now is take about five minutes, just give you a really high level um, explanation of what Envirofill is. We'll have some more time here in a few minutes to kind of talk about the more the nitty gritty details. but. So we've, we've gone over this already, but I think it's important to note there's, I've got a tower over here that's got a bunch of different infill materials in it. Um, it's not a one size fits all, so what we try to do is meet with um, groups like the subcommittee here in Hopkinton and um, Kathy with Gail, and really understand what you all are solving for, because it may require a different infill depending on uh, what your needs are. So here we know it's increased usage, trying to lower the amount of daily maintenance, peace of mind, knowing that you've got a system that you can count on that's gonna be there day in and day out. Um, something that's going to hold up over time. Obviously, you're spending a lot of money on this field. You want it to last as long as you possibly can. And then multi-sport performance. And this one is, is really important as it pertains to why Envirofill was selected. Um, each infill can perform a little bit differently depending on the sport that's being played on it. Envirofill is kind of the utilitarian infill in the sense that it works really well in, with a lot of different sports. And this system was designed to, uh, to make that happen. So what is it? Um, it's an acrylic coated round sand. So the, the roundest sand that you can find in the world comes from central Texas. It's naturally occurring. Um, we've been getting it from there since 2005 and it can be infused with uh, microband antimicrobial technology, which I'll get into here in a second. Why was it created? Uh, it's designed to mimic the most pristine sand-based natural turf that you'll find. So think about the English Premier League or um, Southeastern Conference football. They tend to play on a sand-based Bermuda-type grass. It plays firm, it plays fast. It allows your athletes to get um, superior performance out of the, out of the field itself. Um, it's a non-SBR solution and it's US source. And it creates a very consistent performance for multiple sports, as I mentioned. So a couple of the details I'm gonna to touch on in a little bit more detail. Um, it's safe, it's clean, sustainable, durable, and reusable low maintenance and high performing. So when I say safe, what I mean by that, it's, it's specifically designed for synthetic turf. So these are carefully selected known components that you know, we've done all the research on. It creates an inner granule, so there's no leaching, there's no harmful off-gassing or anything like that that might be released from some other products. It's clean, as I mentioned, it can be infused with an antimicrobial, so it's a non-soluble application 
Um, it's a permanent part of the acrylic polymer that we use to, to coat the sand itself. And what this does, if you think about um, maybe the beach where you know, you've got a lot of heat, you've got a lot of moisture, you know, the sandy infill profile can get uh, some mold, mildew, bacteria, that type of thing. By infusing it with an antimicrobial, you inhibit that, um, and it keeps the field a lot cleaner over the, the life of the field. Sustainable and durable, as I mentioned, it's sourced here in the US, um, and it has an industry-leading 16-year warranty. So another thing to keep in mind about this product is because it's installed as the only product in the, in the turf, it's very easily reclaimed and can be reused for a second life cycle of turf. So at some point, the, the fibers will wear down. You'll want to replace, that, uh, replace the fiber. You extract the infill. The pad also has a 16-year warranty. So two of the three major components of this field are not just a 10 to 12 year life cycle, it's actually as much as 24, life, 24 years in terms of life cycle. So major cost savings on the second, uh, second go around of tariff. Consistent, it offers very reliable, predictable footing. So because it's so round, it doesn't further compact over time the way some other materials might. And that means that from a impact attenuation, um, from a ball bounce, from the speed of the field, that's gonna remain, remain pretty consistent over the, the life of the field. Because it's so heavy, it's a, it's a very heavy product, it stays put in the turf. Um, I'm sure you see it at the, the field on Fruit Street or maybe when you're watching an NFL game, you see kind of the, the infill flying up behind the athlete. You won't see that with this product. It stays put in the, in the turf, and that means that it doesn't migrate around the field as well. And then finally, it's proven. So, um, need to update this slide. We're, we'll be up to about 200 fields internationally by the end of this year. It's the most widely used non crumb rubber um, infill in the world. We've documented reuse, so we've got a handful of places where they've actually reclaimed the infill at this point and reused it in the second life cycle. Um, and our parent company is actually a, a field construction company in the Ohio Valley. So we're backed by 40 years of experience, everything that we bring to the table, including Envirofill. Um, we're not just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. It's tried and true. We've put it through its paces and it's fully vetted by the time it hits the market. And I'll be over here for additional questions in a little bit. Thanks. Steven. All right, so um, just helpful, I think, for everyone, even me, always hear again some of the background on the infill um, as that's. I'd say that's the area where there could be a lot of myths and um, you, there are lots of different kinds of infill. So it's important for us to sort of know what the committee has moved forward and um, the background on it. So appreciate you being here to share that. Sure. Um, one piece before we move forward um, to the, the question and answer portion of our um, session tonight, the community fields coordination. Um, this is a piece that uh, of this project that has really come together and I think has been uh, a great indicator of the community partnerships that already existed, but I think that have been strengthened through the navigation of this process. Um, through the subcommittee, um, we developed another subcommittee, which uh, has worked with Parks and Rec to develop a fields management structure uh, to ensure that the community use uh, producing positive revenue, but also certainly has different parameters of you know when what groups uh, are able to use it, what the costs are, um, what, you know, how money will be allocated towards replacement and maintenance and all those things that are really important. So um, there is a, we do have a memorandum of understanding and in, in that document that has been in the works for over a year. Uh, and it's been a, a great opportunity for us to share ideas, get together, uh, and there would be an oversight committee that meets regularly to continue to make sure that all the policies and procedures that are in place are still working to revisit them if they need revamping as it'll certainly be a work in progress but there's a great baseline there um, and we've used those from comparable com communities but then have tweaked and tailored it to Hopkinton to, to make sure that it feels right for us. Um, and I think that in terms of just the, the questions on that, that will be, uh, again, it will be a work in progress but we have a lot of voices from different groups there that will be able to weigh in and, and continue to make it efficient. Um, so 
Due to the, Jean and I had a quick side conversation and due to the number of people here, we thought that um, rather than have breakout sessions, um, which we had at our last public forum, which I think was helpful, um, maybe for people to think about their questions and be able to ask them for the group so that everyone has the opportunity to hear um, and afterwards have an opportunity maybe to go back um, to Stephen and, and check out the infill if, if you'd like. So at this point, uh, we'd like to open up for questions and then um, we'll talk a little bit after questions about what some of our next steps would be. So, do you want to take that one? Um, I don't know, Kathy, you I can, can probably that answer that the best. Yeah. Um, the problem with the, the number of uses that the school has, as Dee had said, your, your average um, grass field can only provide so many hours of use a day and, and still be able to sustain a decent field. Um, it's like 65 or so hours um, where a turf field, you can use it for like 200, this is, I'm saying 65 per year. A turf field, you can use it up to um, 250 uses a year with a use being about two and a half hours for various events. So you can have two, up to 250 events per year on a turf field where you cannot have as many on the grass field. They just wouldn't, they just won't survive the use, the grass. Start thinking about replacing them after seven years, my understanding. So that, that's probably a better question for Andrew in terms of. <laughs> <laughs> for the turf fields, we've got the turf fields in Green Street, and based on the, um, the, the maintenance that we have done on that field, it's looking like we're going to get 12 to 14 years out of that field. It's, a, it's a nine years old now, and every indication that we've gotten is that it's in very good shape. So. Um, I think we conservatively look at this as a 10-year field, but it's, it's in our own experience here in Hopkinton, we're looking at 12 to 14. Andrew, did you have anything that no, you that, said? It, it, the, the lifespan of a normal field with minimal maintenance is about 10 years. If you do maintain it regularly, and by maintaining it, it's maybe four or five occurrences throughout the year, grooming or sweeping, you can extend the life easily another two to four years, just like the gentleman said. We have fields and all over the country that are 12, 14 years still is it, going strong. Is the maintenance included in the 3.5 million? The maintenance, equi the maintenance equipment's included. Um, the equipment can be run by any kind of facility or maintenance staff. And we, before uh, the, we're with field turf, before we leave, we train the staff on how to do it. Um, one grooming session will take about an hour and a half's time. Uh, and again, you have to do it depending on use, you know, four to six, about four times a year. And ongoing maintenance, I can speak to that. That's part of what we have um, in our joint arrangement with Parks and Rec. So in terms of how uh, the, a revolving fund will be set up so that all of the um, revenue from outside user groups renting the space will go into the revolving fund and the revolving fund will pay for the maintenance. So I think we have a backup slide, but in general right now, um, I believe that the school district is paying about $25,000 a year to maintain the grass fields, and I think that the estimate for the turf fields is more like $9,000 a year, which a, lo a lot of that is savings in time of staff, um, obviously, but that all is part of what we have um, covered in our agreement with Parks and Rec. And that 9000 also includes snow removal if it's required. It, you know, the maintenance. The snow yeah, well, yes, but, yeah. I, but. Can you speak so, to that? Yeah, sure. I, um, so at, at Fruit Street, we end up um, plowing the field so that we can rent to, rent to outside groups. And um, it, it, it's tough because the, the maintenance piece, absolutely, the maintenance number will go up <laughs> if you have to plow it more often because you end up needing to replace infill and, and, and that type of thing. You've probably been down to Fruit Street and seen the snow piles with the, with the infill on it. Once that infill's on the, in, in that snow bank, it's considered contaminated, so we do have to go replace it some more but um, we, we outsource actually to the company that does the, uh, that, that does the Gillette fields to do our plowing. It, it does cost uh, money the way we uh, have handled Fruit Street and, and Parks and Rec would continue to, to probably work under a similar model is um, there are groups that want to rent 
fields on weekends when in, in March when we're up to get snow like we did this month, um, we just enter a, a cost sharing situation with them so that if it snowed last weekend and it needed to be plowed, the fact that it got plowed last Friday benefits the, the group that's going to use it this coming weekend so they get together and, and share all the costs. So, um, you know, the, the maintenance number, uh, I mean, in, in really round numbers, I'd, I'd, I'd say that uh, the Fruit Street turf probably costs us about $12,000 a year. And if you've been down to Fruit Street, the grass down at Fruit Street costs us twenty-two dollars to $25,000 a year to maintain. That's beautiful turf, it's beautiful, uh, beautiful grass down there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's pristine and we're very proud of it. But it does cost a, 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 more money to maintain that year to year than, than the, um, the field does, than the turf does. Just one, one more thing. So if you are plowing in the wintertime, I mean, you have the benefit, you're paying for that service. But you also have the benefit that you have a field that you can play on. So it's not possible to play on a natural grass surface. And then from the maintenance standpoint, any anything outside general maintenance, anything wrong with the field just in general, is covered under the rules. So there's no like, you know, if a logo or something comes up or something happens like that, that's all covered under warranty. We're talking about general, general maintenance. Has the maintenance strategy at Fruit Street changed over the years? Does that still keep the warranty now? Yeah, we have had fields are again for the type of fill material we're looking at here. So, good no, you go. Just, saying, uh, as part of the COC, their certificate of completion, we have to train the, the staff on how to do it. And as long as we do that, the uh, the maintenance staff is able to maintain it as many times as they feel necessary, and doesn't void the warranty at all. Yeah, I I'll tell you, and in, in, in my experience, we've I've walked the field. A few times, and so is Amy Mick from Hopkins Youth Soccer, with the, um, the, the representative from the company that, that installed the turf down there. He says it's in great shape. The, the, the warrant. I mean, we, we've gotten at times when he's he's recommended that we should put some uh, additional infill down, or we should do certain maintenance things so that our warranty is not at risk. But in spite of the fact that we've plowed it two or three times a year for the last I don't know four or five years. Um, we, we're, we're, we still have a warranty on that uh, on that field. It's not like it's not like I'd say, I, I mean I, I always joke that if you know you've got a 25 year warranty on your roof with the shingles, but but I, I think if you read your warranty as soon as you drive a nail through that shingle, the warranty is voided. So. <laughs> Are there any conflicts between the field turf warranty and the infill material warranty? No, uh, we've done multiple projects all over the country. It doesn't have any effect on, on uh, warranty. We're, we're, yeah, we actually, we purchased the Envirofill. So the, the system components equal a system, and the system's what's covered under our warranty. The, uh, following up on the grass question a second ago, what, so what sports in the TVL predominantly play now on turf? as opposed to grass. I played football, I love grass. Yep. I like the idea of the stadium staying grass, at least for now. Mm -hmm. But what, 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 what sports have to be on turf to really be competitive? Sure, so um, field hockey is the first that, you know, is a, every team that is pretty much playing on um, turf. And I say that because even though I explained that there were two teams that do not have turf, uh, they do not have field hockey. So, um, and to just to provide sort of a, an example of, of some of the things that we're facing or some of the obstacles that we face as a result of not having turf. Um, when I first took on this job and we were looking for some non-league field hockey games for what we had was a very competitive field hockey team at the time, places were just unwilling to play us because we didn't have turf. And they were respectful about it, but they just said, sorry, this just doesn't even, this is not gonna prepare us for the postseason. It's not gonna, um, give any type of simulation into what we're dealing with for our entire season. So they, just, they passed on playing our team, which hurt our team because you were unable to then schedule non-league games that um, would be beneficial to them. Um, so field hockey is the first one that is always played on turf um, in the TVL and throughout most of the state. Soccer is I would say in most towns, the varsity programs are playing on turf, but there are grass fields in other towns. Um, and 
is it predominantly played on turf? It depends on what you're looking at across the board. All teams, we have four um, soccer teams, four male soccer teams, four female soccer teams, so eight total. Um, we by far have the most in, in the Tri-Valley League, so there are certainly teams that are playing on grass fields at alternate locations, but the majority of the varsity teams and a lot of times JV are playing on turf. Um, football, most of the teams have a turf stadium, so they are playing. So again, for us, um, we were very fortunate this year. Our, our field looked fantastic thanks to our um, maintenance crew. They, they did a great job getting that field really into awesome condition. Um, so it was great when we were playing on our home field, but when we're going to play away, we were having to rent Fruit Street to give the um, kids. It's just a different. It's a different playing surface. You you know you're running on it differently. You cut on it differently. There aren't the same type of. Um, there's just not the same type of give to some degree. So um, you know we wanted our kids to be able to practice on a surface that was going to be what they'd be playing on that Friday night. Um, and when you look in the spring, lacrosse is predominantly played on um, turf at this point. So again, um, Norton has a brand new lacrosse. Uh, program for their girls particularly so um, and they're in the process I've been in contact with the Norton AD who's been engaging in this same process that we are uh, Millis doesn't have lacrosse so um, and at this point we do have a few teams in the Tri-Valley League that have um, baseball and softball playing on turf and we try we end up having to go over there sometimes and utilize their facilities to be able to play games and even just last week we were supposed to have a, a play day at Medfield and Medway. Medway has a softball turf field, Medfield has a baseball turf field and play a lot of Tri-Valley Leagues during the day. We just happened to draw the short straw, had 8 a.m. games, it was 20 degrees out and in, on, at that point, you're not even gonna play on turf because it's just too cold to play a baseball or softball game, but other teams were able to get their games in renting another field. Um, so when you just think about all the sports that are, that are playing on it, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. Thank you for asking the question, but um, certainly it, it is not a must and I, am, I grew up playing on grass. I love a pristine, a pristine grass field. Um, but again, with the number of teams we have, the usage we have to maintain those fields at the level that we would hope and expect is absolutely impossible. Um, and so right now, again, we're just, there's a ton of constraints based on that, the number of teams we have and the availability. So um, is the baseball infield, is that going to be turf or is that going to be turf? Turf. Mm -hmm. Is it turf? How, how can you slide on the first time turf? Mm -hmm. I play rugby. <laughs> yes. But we're going to keep the grass baseball field too, right? Yep. For varsity. Yeah. Absolutely. And yep. That's, that's so. Dirt. Yeah. So that that's actually a good question. A good segue. So our um, varsity baseball field right now, which is field two, so just right behind the middle school, um, which actually looks awesome right now. If anyone's driven by, new dugouts and um, backstop and wall, and just it looks great. Um, that field will be maintained. Our varsity softball field will be maintained. So obviously, as you saw in the fall, where the highest number of teams would be utilizing the turf, there's going to have to be some shifting of sometimes you're playing on turf, sometimes you're playing on grass. Um, so putting in the turf is not at the expense of then not maintaining the grass fields. It's actually providing opportunity for our maintenance staff to pay closer attention. Right now, there's they are working so hard, they're spread thin. We have 13 fields that they're trying to maintain, some keeping up to game shape, some practice, but they're still maintaining from a safety standpoint and lining and everything. So this would allow them to allocate their energies in a, in a different way to maintain those beautiful grass fields that we have and um, really keep them in tip-top shape. Mm -hmm. Better, one more question. Yeah, that's okay. Oh. Ask I, as many questions I as you want. I've had a problem. I've, I've played on pretty much like every generation of turf. I've played rugby way too long. And uh, we always had a problem in the summertime. We had games canceled because of the heat. It just retains the heat and just sits there. And it's just, like we couldn't have like, with our Timlin run, we couldn't use that space like last year when it was hot out. Everyone would just, it'd be like standing in a parking lot. Yeah. Um, is there anything to sprinkle it? Or is there anything to do to maintain the heat down? Yeah, something? so the Envara feels about 20 degrees cooler than chrome rubber sand is. Um, Probably the biggest thing, and there's still a lot of research being done on this, is the, I call them the heat waves that you see on a, on a chrome rubber field. You don't see that with an environmental field. So 
I usually talk in terms of it being less hot. Synthetic turf, it's, it's mostly plastic. It's gonna get warmer than uh, natural turf, but there is a, a benefit with Envirofill that it brings that temperature down. So. We also have what they call quick connects that we can hook a hose up and spray the field to cool it down if it were that hot, but the Envirofill will keep it less, but we do have the, uh, the ability to you know, hose it down and it, it'll stay cool for a cup, cooler for a couple hours, but you, more, you get the heat more with the crumb rubber. Also, I'm wondering, is lighting part of the budget? And I had heard something about new batting cages. If that's part of it. Sure. Okay. So do you want to address the fundraising? Yep. So we do have, um, there are a couple of members of our subcommittee who are working on community fundraising in, um, in one of the many hats that Amy Nick wears. She's also <laughs> on the boosters board, and they are kind enough to have set up a GoFundMe page. Um, so that money will be, all the money generated from that will go towards this project as well as, you know, you can write the check and they're planning some other fundraisers and the boosters themselves have made a donation. So that's gotten off to um, a great start and that will be ongoing. Um, the batting cages, I believe, are part there of are this project. Cages. So that's included in the project cost. And the third question that you asked, like, lighting is included in the project, but also um, it's included in the grant that we received from CPC. So it's actually two grants. There's a grant for a million dollars to go towards a lot of the project costs, and then there's a specific grant for $720,000 that pays except, uh, specifically for the lighting. That's the cost of the lighting. Um, so that it is included in the project, but it's also included in the CPC grant. And one more piece on the um, fundraising that all of the 500,000, a part of that is community and part of that is corporate sponsor. So we have different groups working on um, those, those corporate sponsorships as well. Welcome. Yes. Can you send it to that site down there? What is the expectation for removal of infill material? The, the base of the field. Say that again. That what's the existing soils? What is yeah? So what is the specification for removing the wet material or the waterlogged material if it's a wetland area? Well, or close to a wetland area, right, not right. in a wetland yeah. area. Um, but removing that to get a stable base, and what if we need to go above the 12 inches of removal to get to a stable base? Okay. We did geotechnical testing as part of our design efforts, um, where we did test pits as well as borings to identify any areas where we might have unsuitable materials. Um, there's one small area that's close to kind of the tower um, that we have a, um, we actually have an allowance in the, um, in the bid that's included in the bid price to account for um, the removal of unsuitable materials. We've given a, a um, conservative estimate. Um, I would say it's maybe 25, not even, maybe 10% of the field in that corner that we'll probably have to take out some excess material. But um, all the topsoil will be removed and taken off site. Uh, most contractors usually have another use for it, so you know you kind of get a deal for that. Um, and then the unsuitables that you know, and we, um, well, whoever they would, Gale Associates usually provides the construction oversight, and um, you know would ensure that whatever unsuitables need to come out have come out, and that the um, they'll do all um, required testing. They'll have to do compaction testing and all that per the specifications that they meet all that criteria. Are there other fields being developed in New England right now that are going to have Envirofill in them? Yeah, there's a dozen in the ground now um, between Connecticut and Massachusetts, and there's probably another, it's, it's, we're right in the middle of bidding season, so yeah. probably another five or six that'll go this summer. Shrewsbury just went out to bid today, and they're going to have almost the same turf that's proposed here. Are you guys doing that one? We are. So would there be an opportunity for you to be back in New England in early May uh, for other business and then you could come to our town meeting perhaps and be a guest? <laughs> Possibly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll certainly do what I can to be here for, for that. Yep. I see you make a special trip because you've got other business that you're oh, yeah. doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can be nearby. That would be good. Sure. He's in Connecticut, so I've already checked him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, was that 
<laughs> they don't want me to come out. <laughs> we've done, you, we've you, done, and you. We've done multiple fields with Enviroville. Yeah, the, um, they, they team together. Med Medfield, High fields. School, Newburyport, and several uh, just in Beverly. Yeah. We haven't we haven't had any on the fields that we've done with with the Enviroville. We've had no complaints at all. Yeah. Why turf? didn't we select Enviroville for Fruit Street? It might not have been around. Yeah, no, yeah it, it didn't exist. exist. It, it wasn't built. Yeah. yeah. They were on the cancer study, and they're trying to class it off as Chinese rabbit tires. But um, some studies are going on now saying that it might have been the actual plastic turf. That's you near know, the whole female um, goalie, soccer goalie, so they spend the most time on the ground. Has there any been? I know there's a five year study that should have been coming up soon, and then there's a 10 year study. Have they have read it? Have you heard anything about those yet? Or? I, I can grab that. So there's been about 300 different studies that have come out. Um, along, along with the states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, Washington, and California. So there's, there's no conclusive evidence whatsoever. And the state of Washington actually came out after the goalie study because they were really concerned about it. They, the, the, not the study, but the article. Uh, it was a news telecast from NBC. They were concerned. So the state did their own internal research and came back recently, I think about three months ago, and said, no, there's no there's no correlation at all whatsoever with um, even playing on crumb rubber and cancer, um, and you know, we we do we do a lot of research on it because we we've done about twenty thousand fields all over the world, so we believe that if there was an issue, number one, our installers, there would be such a higher incidence of cancer with our installers just because they're you know they're they're on it every day for months and months and months and months with rubber kind of going all over the body, um, and then also football players. We've looked really hard at both of those two populations, and then internally we we haven't seen any kind of um, data that would suggest anything close to it causing cancer. Um, you know, the one big thing would be the crumb rubber. That's what most people kind of hang their hat on, and this field will have no crumb rubber whatsoever. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 They're not getting this warm. Early season playability. Is there a with the crumb rubber, it does heat up and it does allow people to get on the fields very early because it, it melts the snow mm -hmm. on the top. With this type of infill material, is it closer to a soil temperature? Um, yes, yeah, I guess so. I, I would say if you're plowing, it's gonna be relatively the same amount of time to get on the field because you're, you're leaving, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about an inch of snow that you leave. Plow touching the right. carpet ever, because right. if it does, then the carpet's not made to be, you know, to be plowed. It would hurt the fibers. It would hurt the infill, etc. So the standard practice is to leave about an inch or, or two inches on top of the um, on top of the the turf, and then you know if you give it a couple hours, it will melt. There's also things that you can add to the turf field to increase the um, melting capacity. So there's chemicals you can put on that are non-toxic. Um, that you can put on that's used on the, the streets uh, that will melt it fairly quickly. I mean, there's also kind of archaic things that actually work. You take bar uh, metal barrels and tip them upside down all over the field. The barrels heat up and heat it, and then the, and the, then they kind of connect. So there, there are a few different ways to do it, but I think it, it melts slightly slower than crumb rubber, um, but still, you know, within, uh, within a half a day, the field would be gone, even if there was... Um, there was about an inch or inch and a half left on the field. Yeah, it, it's a negligible difference. It's going to melt slower, but not noticeably. Other questions? Okay. All right. Is the design of the carpet going to be um, with the lines laid in, or is it going to be painted? It, it, it's a combination. Um, the school has, um, working with the athletic de department, as we said, the, the baseball and the softball, the infills will be turf. Um, the multi-purpose field, right now we've decided, it, or the school's decided that the lines for the multi-purpose will be tufted, which they call would be permanent, would be soccer and field hockey only. The other sports, lacrosse and the football lines will be painted. 
And what we do is when they put in the carpet, they actually put in what they call tick marks. So then you can, it can be painted fairly easily, but you do get some shadowing, you know, because as the paint wears off, so it's pretty easy to go back and repaint it afterwards. But um, that's where we're, that's where we've dictated uh, right now. One thing I think that that could get very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, Nobles Greeno paints their synthetic, the entire thing for every sport. It comes out very clean. Yeah, and Lincoln Sudbury, we've got the same thing. They've got two, just, just a huge two side-by-side -side fields and they paint everything. Um, the, you know, it's, it's really dictated by what the school wants and what they anticipate the uses. Um, like I said, that's showing everything, so it's, it looks a little busy. Um, you'll, with the field hockey is going to actually be black lined and the soccer will be yellow. That You know, you'll have the one, the yellow lines, which aren't, um, yeah, it's busy. Yeah, I'm imagining it, it, yellow, red, and another line on a baseball infield and it changing from green to brown mm -hmm. and it being. Yeah, they, you know, we've, we've done the numerous fields and the kids seem to figure it out, you know, but um, it won't be, like I said, that exhibit shows all the lines just to kind of demonstrate that they, you know, what the fields of that all fit you know, and make sure we're meeting all the dimensions and stuff through the regulations. But um, we'll just have the yellow. The football makes it look really busy. Um, but. Some of the rationale behind that is, um, you know, for those who have been following the project a little bit, this is the proposed phase one. There's also a phase two, which would um, include potentially putting turf on um, the stadium field, which is field three, which would also include a track expansion. Um, and in terms of, you know, the inland lines, that field would then be ready for lacrosse right now. Um, that field with grass is not regulation for lacrosse, uh, which was the rationale behind not, you know, how did you decide field hockey and soccer versus lacrosse um, with the future intent of uh, track needing to be resurfaced anyways, um, and hopefully an expansion of getting an eight lane track, which um, we have almost 200 student athletes on our track team, so we need that. Um, but, you know, so doing those lines on those, um, on that field long term, you know, whether it ends up being turf or grass, the expansion is going to need to happen. So, um, so that was the rationale behind it, just for some background. So I'm curious about seating for fans. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I saw something about portable um, yep. stands. Right now, I know if a soccer game is played there, the fans are all sitting on the hill. Yep. So, is the hill still going to exist? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the hill will exist now. Um, as Dee said later on, that hill will get, if the track gets expanded, um, it'll be more, the hill will become more, the track's going to push into that and there'll be a retaining wall. Um, as far as portable stands, right now we, we're proposing they're actually behind home plate on baseball. Um, and then the, the school does have some portable bleachers that, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the sport, they'll be able to bring them on. Like we, we propose, there's like three racks. These are like 50 seats with wheels that the school will be able to bring in and put either along the soccer fields. Yeah. Um, but you also have safety runouts and stuff that people will be able to put chairs just like Fruit Street or whatever okay. as well. Um, but the, as I said, we were proposing as part of the project, they're going to purchase about 150 seats of portable bleachers that can get moved around. Right now, we've kind of left it like a permanent home here, but they will get moved depending on the seasons and such. And the school does own a few of their own. That, um, it, like I said, when it's not um, baseball season, you know, that, that those can get moved into the fields and sit right on top. And, and just. Um, and is it all fenced in? Yes. Yes. There's a six-foot chain link fence around the entire facility. Okay. And the reason it's six foot is because you have baseball and softball. The thought of going four foot, it, you know, it, it does help a little bit with the balls. And there's also um, proposed safety netting along this side to keep baseballs from going out into the street and people's cars and things like that. Where's all the water going to go? The water infiltrates into the ground at a very slow rate because of the voids in the stone, but eventually it'll go right where it does now. It'll end up in the wetlands back behind uh, the school, but a lot of the water never even leaves the field. It infiltrates right into the stone and into the ground, and um, we only put the drainage system in the bottom of, you know, some 
big fluke, you know, unbelievable storm that it just helps get it out of the way. But um, the, the theory of um, how the turf fields work and what we've seen is the majority of it's just going to filter right into the soils. Yes. Yep. We actually, as part of our design, um, we designed both fields for stormwater and actually permitted through the Conservation Commission, um, met the Mass DEP stormwater handbook regulations and all of that, because um, we wanted to make sure that what we did below was going to work with, especially like we said, with ex possibly expanding the track and how that was all going to tie together. So that whole upper field has been designed, um, basically, and, and permitted, in fact. Uh, that's never really been in our <laughs> in our scope. But. The current varsity baseball field. Yeah. No, that, I think the intention would be for that to stay grass. Um, and you know, again, we I think many of us here, and I can speak at least personally for myself. I really value grass fields, um, natural grass fields, um, and the opportunity to play on them. And I think again, it goes beyond all the reasons that were mentioned, I think the ability for our uh, maintenance department to allocate their time and energies to maintain the grass fields that we will have really well, um, opportunity for them and obviously um, for us to be able to, when those times come that we are playing, for example, if there's you know, a lacrosse game scheduled on the same day as a baseball or softball game, that you can actually have all three going on at once. And likewise, there would have to be, you know, my job would be to provide equity between all teams. Sometimes uh, the lacrosse team would be playing over on field 13 and there's a baseball game happening on turf and maybe a JV game happening up on the grass or vice versa. So um, there has not been any discussion or intention of um, changing the, the field two into synthetic turf. Any other questions? All right, well, we're available if people's questions come up and um, appreciate people coming to ask and learn. Um, I'm gonna say thank you so much, but then quickly turn it over to Jean to talk a little bit about just next steps and where we are in the process. Before I do so, I um, wanted to just again tell everyone how grateful I am for you coming out, for our guest speakers, um, Stephen, Andrew, Kathy, for being here to really intelligently speak to your areas of expertise and what you do is, is incredibly helpful and informative. Um, and for those of you who are community members, members of the school committee um, and central office administration, um, thank you for being here to support and learn about the project. Just really, really appreciate it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jean and she'll talk a little bit about our next step. Okay, thank you. And um, before I start, I really want to thank Dee in particular for taking this project on. She walked in the door as a new athletic director and inherited this project, which is really, typically isn't driven by an athletic director. And she's done a tremendous job in addition to managing the most number of teams in the Tri-Valley League and um, dealing with the, the vagaries of New England weather on a daily basis. So I really wanted to thank her personally. Um, while I have the opportunity to do it on HCAM, and the next thing that I want to do is thank HCAM for always being so available and making this um, accessible to everybody. That you know, there I think there you are covering four other events tonight, and people are attending all of those. So everybody can't be all in one place, and HCAM never says no to us. So thank you for making this accessible to the rest of the community, and we will get this posted as soon as it's available. So with that said, I just want to talk about the procedural steps um, that follow this. So as you all know, as Hawkington residents, um, we are governed by the town meeting process. So uh, the decision on the formal funding was made last night at the Board of Selectmen meeting, and it was decided that um, this will be a project that will be, the borrowing will be funded within the levy limit. And without going too far into the details of municipal finance, what that means to people who are interested in this project one way or the other is that you must be present at town meeting to vote on this project. There will be one vote on this project. It will be at town meeting. I'm gonna look at Brian and guess that it's gonna be on the first night, which is May 7th. It will, based on where it is on the warrant right now, it should be on May 7th or May 8th. But please follow the process, follow our Facebook page, follow our website, um, and, and just pay attention to when this is coming forward. It either will be most likely May 7th or May 8th, but that is when town meeting is. So 
whatever you feel about this project, if you're not there to raise your hand one way or the other, it, it only matters to you. So that is how you can participate and, 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 um, and cast your vote on what you would like to see for the towns. So, um, and then beyond that, if, you, if you're so inclined and you can support the boosters community fundraising efforts, that would be much appreciated and certainly do a little bit to lighten the tax burden um, on the town. And I, I think just finally what I want to say at the end is, um, you know, this is not a school project. This is a project for the community that is located at the schools. And that is the spirit in which the school committee has undertaken this project. This is absolutely solving a need that we have at the schools, but we want it to be a community asset available to all of the, of the um, youth groups and adult leagues in the town, as well as to generate some revenue so that um, it, it should sustain itself. So um, again, we really appreciate the collaboration that we've had across the community from Parks and Rec and many other town um, boards. And um, so we, we really feel like this is gonna add something of value to the town and we hope that, that you will follow the process and exercise your right to vote on March 7th. So thank you very much. We'll be here to answer any questions and I really invite you to come over and check out the turf. There are lots of samples. You can scratch at it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.